All right, this is your lecture on the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, who lived from 1809 to 1849. Poe was orphaned at a young age and grew up fostered by the wealthy Allen family in Virginia. After dropping out of university and the army, he became one of the first writers of the time to make a living from publishing his stories and criticism. Possibly his best-known work, The Raven, published in 1845, won him considerable fame and success. But he had much financial and mental difficulty throughout his life, particularly after the death of his wife, Virginia, who just happened to be his second cousin and was very young when he married her. Poe's death in 1849 was a much-debated tragedy. Alcohol, suicide, tuberculosis, and many other things have been attributed as causes. All right, historical context of The Raven. Edgar Allan Poe wrote The Raven while his wife, Virginia, was ill with tuberculosis, a disease that had already robbed him of three family members. Critics consider the character of Lenore, presumably the narrator's lost beloved, to be a representation of Virginia. Virginia's premature death is also thought to have inspired other works by Poe, including Annabel Lee, and a poem actually called Lenore, in which, as in The Raven, a man copes with the death of a young woman, though Lenore ultimately ends on a note of optimism, in contrast to the madness and despair of The Raven. All right, other books related to The Raven. The Raven is an example of Gothic literature. Origer originating in 18th century England, the Gothic typically includes elements of the supernatural, horror, doomed romance, and melodrama. Like The Raven, Gothic works like Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte and Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte find their characters in dreary isolation, struggling with intense passions, while surrounded by spooky, otherworldly, otherworldly influences that are often connected both with the supernatural and the subconsciousness of the characters. Key facts about The Raven. It was written in, on January the 29th of 1845. It is not known where it was written. It was published on January the 29th of 1845 in the New York Evening Mirror. The literary period is Romantic, Early Victorian. The genre is narrative poem. The setting is the narrator's home on a mid, at midnight in December. The climax uh, occurs, as the narrator tells us, at the conclusion of the poem, when the raven remains in his home, possibly forever. The antagonist is the raven. The poem is told from the point of view of the narrator. And a brief summary is the unnamed narrator is alone in his house on a cold December evening, trying to read. As he is about to fall asleep, he hears a quiet knock at his door, but decides to ignore it. He says that he has been reading in the hopes of relieving his sorrow over Lenore, his beloved, who has passed away. Though he tries to convince himself that nothing is there, his curiosity and fear overwhelm him. He eventually opens his door, speaking, Lenore, into the darkness. When he hears tapping at his window, he opens that too, and a raven flies inside his room, landing on a bust of Pallas. The narrator jokingly asks the raven's name and is surprised to hear it respond, nevermore. He mutters to himself that the raven will probably leave him just as his friends and loved ones did, to which the raven responds once more, nevermore. The narrator then seats himself directly in front of the bird, trying to understand what it means by nevermore. Suddenly, the narrator perceives that angels sent by God have caused the air to become dense and perfumed. Anxious, he asks the raven if the angels are a sign that heaven will relieve him of his sorrows, to which the bird again says, nevermore. With the same response, the bird rejects his hopes that he might see Lenore again in heaven, as well as his impassioned request for the bird to leave him alone 
Finally, the narrator tells us that the raven has continued to sit atop his chamber door above the bust of Pallas, and that he will live forever in its shadow. All right, now we're going to talk about themes. The first one is death and the afterlife. As with many other of Poe's works, the raven explores death. More specifically, this poem explores the effects of death on the living, such as grief, mourning, and the memories of the deceased, as well as the question that so often torments those who have lost loved ones to death, whether there is an afterlife in which they will be reunited with the dead. At the beginning of the poem, the narrator is mourning alone in a dark, cheerless room. He portrays himself as trying to find surcease of sorrow by reading his books. One might read this as an effort to distract himself and thereby escape the pain of the death of a loved one. One might also interpret the, interpret the narrator's readings of books of forgotten lore to indicate that he is looking for arcane knowledge about how to reverse death. In either case, his reaction to the death of a loved one is rather typical to try to escape the pain of it or attempt to deny death. Before the raven's arrival, the narrator hears a knocking at the door of his room, and after finding no one there, calls, Lenore? Into the darkness, as if sensing or hoping she has returned to him. Following the raven's arrival, he eventually asks the bird if there is balm in Gilead implying a hope that he might see Lenore once more in heaven. In either case, the narrator's desperate desire to be reunited, reunited with Lenore in some way is obvious. In Lenore, another of Poe's poems featuring a deceased woman named Lenore, the narrator, confronted with the loss of his wife, reassures himself with the prospect that he will see her again in heaven. In The Raven, however, the narrator ultimately takes a gloomier view. After the raven arrives, cutting short their narrator's sense that Lenore might be visiting as a ghost, and answering his hopeful questions about Gilead with only the repeated, nevermore, the narrator resigns himself to believing that he will never encounter Lenore again. Poe leaves unclear whether the raven is telling the narrator the truth are giving voice to the narrator's own anxieties about having lost Lenore for good. Either way, the poem concludes on the pessimistic note that nothing can exist beyond death, that there is no balm in Gilead. The next thing is memory and loss. Often memories of the dead are presented as purely positive, as a way for the departed to continue to exist in the hearts and minds of those who remember them, and as a source of comfort for those who are still alive. The raven flips this notion on its head, envisioning memories of a deceased loved one as a sorrowful, inescapable burden. As the poem begins, the narrator is struggling to put his anguished memories of Lenore aside, and attempts to distract himself by reading. But the insistent rapping at his study door interrupts his efforts, and he opens his study door and seems to sense the presence of Lenore and hear a whisper of her name. That moment of hearing the knock on the door and opening it to an almost there ghostly presence can be read as supernatural, but it also is a perfect metaphor for obsessive memories that continue to intrude into one's thoughts and from which one can't escape. With the arrival of the raven, the narrator's desire to escape from his sorrowful, overwhelming memories comes to seem even more unattainable. Because the narrator's other friends um, and hopes have flown before, he at first reasonably expects that the raven will do the same. But the bird remains a constant presence, becoming itself like memories of Lenore ever-present and inescapable, and its cry of nevermore enforces in the speaker a belief that he lacks the power to escape his memories. In what may be read as another supernatural moment or as a manifestation of a final desperate hope for relief, the narrator then perceives that the air grows dense, perfumed, 
and inhabited by Sapphira, our angels. The narrator cries, the narrator cries and cries, Wretch, thy God hath lent thee. By these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nephium from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind and nephium, and forget this lost Lenore. In Homer's Odyssey, Nephian is a drug that erases memories, and so in this moment the narrator is hoping that even if he cannot help himself escape his memories, that some sort of divine intervention will intercede on his behalf. The raven, of course, answers only, nevermore. And in so doing, quashes the narrator's hopes for escape from the torment of remembering his dead love. Memories of loss and sadness, the poem implies, can never be escaped. They flutter always in the brain like a bird that will not leave a room. The next theme is the supernatural and the subconscious. The Raven is an example of Gothic literature, a genre that originated in 18th century England. Hallmarks of Gothic works include horror, death, the supernatural, and occasionally romance. Their characters are often highly emotional and secluded from society, living in dark, gloomy, medieval-like homes surrounded by wild natural landscapes. Gothic refers to the architectural style of the residences in which these novels are set. The Raven contains many elements that point to the narrative's Gothic nature, a lonely character in a state of deep emotion, the cold and dark of a midnight in December. The raven itself, a seemingly demonic talking bird that arrives at midnight, is the poem's most prominent example of the supernatural. Gothic works, such as Frankenstein, Jane Eyre, and Wuthering Heights, to name a few, tend to make ambiguous whether the supernatural events they describe are actually happening, or if these events are a product of the character's subconscious. The Raven, by leaving unresolved the question of whether the Raven is the genuine presence of a supernatural force or a figment of the tortured narrator's imaginations, fits squarely into this tradition. At the start of the poem, the narrator is reading his books in a failed attempt to distract himself from his grief at the death of his beloved Lenore and is drowsing off. He then describes himself as having been roused by a mysterious tapping at his door and senses the presence of his dead love, Lenore, followed by the arrival of the raven through the window. Perhaps the raven truly has arrived, but the narrator's exhaustion leaves open the possibility that he has actually fallen more deeply asleep and that the knock he hears signals the beginning of his entrance into a dream state. The raven and its repeated message of nevermore may be a supernatural visitation or an expression of the narrator's loss and doubts, a nightmare from which the narrator can never fully awaken. Ultimately, the poem does not take sides on whether its events should be interpreted as either entirely supernatural or entirely a result of the subconscious. In fact, the way it straddles and ties together the subconscious and the supernatural helps to give the poem much of its power, depicting someone forced to confront the uncertainty, unknowability, and despair of losing a loved one and having to face the profound and unanswerable question of death. The next theme is rationality and irrationality. In an essay titled The Philosophy of Composition, in which Poe explained his writing of the Raven, he describes the narrator as a scholar, a learned person devoted to rational investigation. It is therefore natural for the speaker to attempt to escape his obsessive memories of his wife by reading ancient lore. And when he senses Lenore's presence, he comforts himself with the words, nothing more, to assure himself that a ghost has not actually paid him a visit. Even after he meets the raven, he supposes that its first replies of nevermore are only stock and store, that the bird is only parroting a phrase it has heard before from a previous unhappy owner. <laughs> 
Put another way, the speaker attempts to respond to and understand the raven and the world in a rational manner. But the poem shows how the speaker's rationality can't cope with the profound irrationality of the raven and its responses, and even shows how the speaker's despair at the death of Lenore and his desperate attempts to understand the raven rationally leads him to a frantic irrationality of his own. Although the raven exerts no tangible power over the speaker, and in fact seems not even to notice the narrator's pained reactions to its constant message, the narrator nevertheless sees the bird as an ill omen of tragedy that means him harm. The speaker's obsession with his beloved's death is such that he immediately associates the bird's arrival with his memories of Lenore and his despair making this connection without concrete evidence. Further, it's important to note that the raven is gifted with speech, not conversation. No matter what the speaker says, whether to himself or directly to the bird, the raven responds mechanically with, Nevermore. The raven never addresses the subject of Lenore directly. It is the narrator who chooses to interpret its remarks in the context of his lost love. Considering that Poe envisioned the narrator as a scholar, it is possible to understand the narrator's reading of the raven's remarks as similar to how he might approach his books and that he performs a sort of literary analysis of the raven and its comments viewing them as the denial of all his desires and hopes. The narrator, whose despair over death leads him to need to understand whether he might ever again hope to see Lenore, interprets that the raven is responding to him and is bringing him a message, but it is not at all clear that that is the case. He attempts over and over to rationally make sense of a response that makes no sense. And as the cliché goes, continuing to do the same thing with the hope of a different result is the definition of insanity. Through the poem, the raven perches above a bust or a statue of Pallas, a reference to Pallas Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. This placement of the nevermore spouting bird on top of the goddess of wisdom suggests the victory of the irrational over the narrator's ability to think clearly and rationally. At the conclusion of the poem, the narrator describes seeing the, seeing the raven still sitting upon the bust of Pallas, never flitting. The image places irrationality above rationality forever. One can therefore read the raven as suggesting that the bird makes its eternal nest solely in the narrator's frantic mind. His irrational tendencies in the face of his lost Lenore, bordering on madness, make his rational approach moot, suggesting that the aftermath of an event as traumatizing as the death of one's beloved cannot be overcome with measured, sensible thinking. All right, the next theme is ancient influences throughout the poem. Po Poe makes repeated references to classical mythology and the Bible. Ancient lore, such as what the narrator might have been studying at the beginning of the text. Pallas, the bust on which the raven perches, is a reference to Pallas Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. Like Pallas Athena, the raven hails from saintly days of yore. The bird's choice of landing place illustrates its relationship to ancient divine omniscient authority solidifying a connection that the speaker makes explicit when he dubs the bird a prophet. Further, nephephine is described in Homer's Odyssey as a drug that erases memories, while the Platonian shores are a reference to the god Pluto, the Roman equivalent of Hades in Greek mythology who reigns over the underworld. The mention of Gilead refers to the Old Testament line in Jeremiah 8.22. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And Aden refers to the Garden of Eden. While these references help to establish the narrator as a scholar, they also allow Poe to anchor his poem to the classic literature of antiquity, lending the raven the authoritative weight of Western literature's foundational texts. 
These references also suggest that what the narrator experiences is universal and timeless across all humanity, from the present back to the founding texts of Western literature. At the same time, the narrator's continued references to ancient literature, su little, little, late, ancient literature suggest that just as he is unable to divert his attention from his past with Lenore, he is mired in the past at large. His impulse to view his experiences in the context of these works is echoed by his impulse to view the raven and its antics in the context of Lenore. The past becomes a lens through which he perceives the present. All right, character analysis. The narrator. Poe's unnamed narrator is a scholar who is mourning the death of his beloved Lenore. He is alone in his house on a cold December midnight, trying to distract himself from his thoughts of her by reading old books. The narrator is a scholar, learned and reasonable, yet his logic and knowledge do not much help him to recover from the impact of Lenore's death or to escape his desperate hope to see her again. His desperation leads him to emotional extremes, from depression to near euphoria, and finally to depression once the raven pronounces that he and Lenore will be apart forever. It is never made clear whether a supernatural raven actually visits him or drives him to an ultimate despair, or whether his own obsessive doubts lead him to imagine the raven, but in either case the raven overthrows the narrator's rational mind. Lenore Critics consider Lenore, the narrator's lost love, to be a representation of Poe's own deceased wife, Virginia. While Lenore never actually appears in the poem and nothing is revealed about her other than her status as the narrator's beloved, her present looms over the text, as the narrator cannot prevent himself grieving her passing and wondering if he might be able to see her again. Then there's the raven. The raven is a bird that enters the narrator's house while the narrator is grieving over his lost love in the middle of the night and then lands upon the narrator's bust of palace. To everything the narrator says, the raven responds with just one word, nevermore. The bird acts in no other way, neither attacking the narrator nor seeming to wish him harm, but the narrator views it as his, at best as supernatural and at worst, demonic. Further, the narrator interprets the raven's repeated nevermore as a refusal of all his desires to be reunited with Lenore. At the end of the poem, the narrator observes that the raven is still perched atop the bust of Pallas, and it will likely remain there forever, and that he will spend the rest of his life living under its evil influence. Whether the raven is a supernatural being or a product of the narrator's imagination is unclear, and in this way the poem creates a connection, typical of Gothic literature, between the subconscious and the supernatural. All right, symbols. First one we're going to talk about is Pallas. Pallas refers to Pallas Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. The bust of Pallas in the narrator's chamber represents his interest in learning and scholarship and also can be taken as representing rationality in general and his own rational sane mind in particular. The raven, by landing on the bust when it flies into the room, signifies a threat to the narrator's reason and the ability of rationality to analyze and understand the reasons, if any, behind the raven's coming and its message. That the raven stays on top of the bust of Pallas at the end of the poem Never flitting suggests the dominance of irrationality and fear over reason in general, and more particularly that irrationality has taken up a permanent home in the narrator's formerly rational mind. The next is the raven. Ravens are commonly viewed as symbols for evil, death, and supernatural forces. The narrator comes to see the raven, which visits when the narrator is in deepest mourning, over the death of his beloved Lenore, and exactly these terms, as a kind of supernatural emissary that has come to crush his hopes of ever being reunited with Lenore in heaven. The narrator sees the raven not just as symbolizing death, but as symbolizing a specific kind of death, a death without heaven, a death that is simply the end. 
All of that said, what the raven symbolizes in the poem is not exactly the same as what it symbolizes to the narrator. First, a reading of the poem in which the narrator actually falls asleep and then dreams the rest of the events shifts the meaning of the raven from a supernatural messenger about death to an embodiment of the grief-stricken narrator's own doubts and fears about what happens after death. Further, regardless of whether the narrator is awake or asleep, it is, it is possible to interpret, interpret the raven as symbolizing not a meaningless death, but rather irrationality or unknowability. After all, the raven never actually says anything other than nevermore. And it never says that word except in response to a question from the narrator. The raven's nevermore never quite makes actual sense, but the narrator interprets it to be a message of death without an afterlife. In this view, the raven symbolizes the unknowable mystery that the narrator and human beings more generally frantically try to use their reason to understand um, because an unknowable, like what happens after death, is scary. But reason fails, just as the narrator does, in figuring out the unknowable. The raven perching forevermore on the bust of Pallas Athena, goddess of wisdom and reason, indicates the triumph of the irrational and unknowable over any rational attempt to figure it out. All right, the last symbol is Knight's Platonian Shore. Platonian is a reference to Pluto, the Roman god of the underworld. The narrator, upon first encountering the raven, is amused by its stately comportment and jokingly accuse it, accuses it of having emerged from the night's Platonian shore, the border between the worlds of the living and the dead. At the close of the poem, the narrator, no longer amused and convinced that the bird means him ill, repeats the phrase with convention, conviction suggesting that the raven is a messenger of death, but not a death in which souls travel up to a heavenly, heavenly paradise where they are reunited with the other departed, but instead a death of blackness and despair. All right, there's just a couple more things I wanted to uh, let you, you know, know about. Um, another thing about Poe is, um, besides pioneering the development of the short story, Poe also invented the format for the detective story as we know it today. Um, he also was an outstanding literary critic. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the source of inspiration for this poem. He was inspired to write his poem after reading about the raven in Charles Dickinson's 1841 novel, Barnaby Rudge, a historical novel in which a mentally retarded person, Barnaby, is falsely accused of participating in anti-Catholic riots in 1780. Barnaby owns a pet raven, Grip, which can speak. In the fifth chapter of the novel, Grip taps at a shutter, as in Poe's poem. The model for Grip was Dickinson's own talking raven, which was the delight of his children. It was the first of three ravens owned by Dickens, all named Grip, and the first Grip, after the first Grip died, it was stuffed and mounted. An admir admirer of Poe's work acquired the mounted bird and donated it to the Free Library of Philadelphia, where it is on display today. All right, then I'm just going to talk about a little bit about the meter and that kind of stuff, just in case any of you are interested in looking at that kind of thing your papers. If you're not interested in that kind of thing, you can close this, le close this lecture now because I'm not going to ask anything about this on the quiz. Just know that now. Okay, the basic meter of the raven is five lines of trochaic octometer followed by a six line of trochaic tetrameter, though there are obvious variations. As or more important perhaps is the regular and repetitive A, B, C, B, B, B rhyme scheme, in which the B words all rhyme with nevermore. Poe himself com commented extensively on the writing of the raven in his essay, The Philosophy of Composition, 
The American Tradition and Literature, 5th edition, from New York Random House, uh, published in 1981. While it is highly likely that the account of how he constructed the poem is largely tongue-in-cheek, Poe's descriptions of the actual effects of the poem are illuminating. Since he intended the poem to have a rhyming refrain, the sound of the rhyming syllable would be ramified down the entire composition. Poe selected the long O vowel sound for its sonorous, emphatic quality. The R consonant followed because the combination presented the most productive rhyming opportunities for the refrain. He knew he wanted the poem to have a melancholy tone, and from the intersection of melancholy words and the sonorous long O-R syllable, he selected nevermore as most apt. He then needed a vehicle to repeat this word in the refrain, and so selected the now iconic raven. Having already determined the tone, structure, and sound of the poem, he lastly determined the subject matter, arriving at the death of a beautiful woman as the intersection of the melancholiness subject, death, and the most poetical subject, beauty. Note that this is a very methodological approach to poetry. The words construct and build spring to mind, and that in this approach the sounds of the poem are foundational, decided on even before the imagery and subject matter. So, if you're going to write about that, maybe that's some information you can use. That's the end of your lecture for the Raven.